guys, I've just worked out where Dave has bought me after climbing up um, Jacob's Ladder with the car. We are at... Seahorse World and Southern Ocean Aquarium and Platypus House. Looks cool. Let's go and check it out. And they also have echidnas here and apparently you sit on the floor and they'll have three echidnas or whatever walking around they walk over your legs and you can touch them and stuff. Oh, how cute. Follow the little seahorses. Apparently they breed the seahorses here and they send them all over the world. Yeah, so pretty much the only way to tell the difference between a male and female platypus from the outside are uh, these little spiky bits on their back feet. Sorry. So that's called spurs. And only the male platypus have those lines. Can everyone see that okay? So the male platypus can produce a neurotoxin. So unlike a snake or a spider bite that will go into your bloodstream, neurotoxin will actually attach to your nerve endings and stay in the same spot, creating a non-lethal but very, very painful three to six months of your life at most. And there's a picture just over in the corner there in that black picture frame of a man who was stung by a male platypus. Looks a bit like an inflated rubber glove, so pretty gnarly stuff, isn't it? Turns out these little guys aren't so cute and cuddly after all. Now, if you do get stung by a male platypus, there is pretty much nothing we can do for you. Painkillers, such as morphine, are pretty much ineffective. Nerve blockers will only tend to work for the first couple of hours. And to top it all off, there will probably never be an antidote to these little guys' venom as each male platypus has its own kind of unique coat of it and it changes throughout the year. You know, all that being said, if you do go swimming in the same dam or river as one, you've really got nothing to worry about. They're not going to come up to you and spur you at random. In fact, they're probably not going to come up to you at all. Uh, the only people who are getting stung, which is not very many, are people trying to pick them up. So usually they help them like a vet or a scientist or a fisherman if they're caught in a fishing net. But if there's one thing I want all of you to take away from this tour today, guys, it is never touch a platypus. Does that sound good? Some of them are sensitive to touch and others are sensitive to electrical pulses. 
So these guys are always looking around for heartbeats and muscle movements of their prey. So we do have to feed everything to them live, otherwise they wouldn't really be able to find it. You'll notice that they only really use their front feet to paddle themselves along. Those back feet are used mainly as rudders, like a boat to steer themselves around. Certainly very handy if they face backwards. It makes it nice and easy for them to just flick them out and make those sharp turns really quickly. We don't want to hang around this little front area by the door for too long while we're heading in. We don't want to keep that door open for any little escape artists we might have on our hands. You can hear one at the door right now. Alrighty, so here we have our three little echidnas. So over there, closest to the door, we have Edwina, who is a boy, so we did get that name a bit mixed up. Uh, he is around 19 years old. In the middle here, we have Eddie, who is our girl. So we got those names a bit swapped around. Uh, she's actually our oldest animal that we have here at Platypus House. She's around 21 years old. And then over here at the other end, we have Thomas, who is a boy. We did get that right. Uh, he is our youngest and our biggest echidna. He's around 10 or 11 years old, and whenever he gets the chance, he does like to steal everyone else's food, and that's why he's our biggest. Uh, so what we're feeding them there is made by a company called Veta Farm. It's made at Taronga Zoo. It's basically just a special little echidna mix of different bugs crushed up into a little powder that we mix with water and olive oil to make it nice and easy to digest for them. And then we'll top it off with some fly pupae and mealworms, sometimes crickets or small spiders, whatever bugs we can find really. So it's basically just a bug smoothie in there, but they seem to like it. Gourmet stuff, I'd say. Can't open those mouths very wide, so pretty much all they can do is open it wide enough to stick their tongues out and let all the bugs stick to that, and then pull it straight back in. So they're not going to bite you, I promise. There we go, all sharing. Can you feed them every two or three times? Yeah, so they'll always get the same amount of food per day. We'll just give them a bit less if we're doing a lot of tours. Yeah, so. Um, if we've got any left over after all the tours are done, we'll spread it around the room for them to find. Pop them in a little pine cone, like a little lick mat for them as well. Where do they spend the night? In burrows or...? Um, in the wild, they'll go into the little burrows that they dig. Um, they're not as complex as what the platypus will, will dig. They'll, they're only about a metre into the ground because they know they have their spines to protect themselves, so it's basically just a shelter for them. Um, but in here, they like that little area over there to sleep in. We won't put them anywhere um, to go to bed, or that little stump over there is also a pretty popular spot. Does anyone want to have a guess as to how many spikes these little guys have on their bodies? It's quite a lot more than what most people think. Oh, round about, so on average they'll all have around 1,500 spines on their little bodies. So that includes lots of little ones around their faces and the sides of their bellies. A lot of the time, people from the mainland of Australia think their echidnas up there are a lot spikier than what they are down here, because it definitely does look that way. Uh, it's not I actually true it. though. Yeah, so just down here in Tasmania, it's a lot cooler climate, so these guys, for during the winter months, need a lot more fur to keep themselves nice and warm, and it covers up a lot of their spines. Especially Eddie here, she looks like she has barely any spines at all. Mm -hmm. She has around the same amount, she's just got a lot thicker and denser fur than what the boys do, and it covers up a lot more of her spines. Mm -hmm. Uh, but those spines are made out of keratin, so the same stuff as our hair and our nails. Yeah. No, so you might be thinking of a porcupine. Porky they've, yeah, they've got the, the little minuscule barbs in their quills, so they can actually kind of eject them if something uh, digs into them. So what is the difference in other than ejecting them than a porcupine and a... An echidna? Porcupines, yeah, so they're a bit bigger. They've got really long, thin quills. They're actually, like, they're about that long. Um, they can eject eject those quills as well. They're found in North America, I believe. So, yeah, there's like, quite a few differences. They actually look... If you, take, if you look one up, they actually look like really different. <laughs> right. <laughs> Both of these places were founded by the same person. 
So Seahorse World was founded about 25 years ago. Um, then they opened this one about 16 years ago, so that one's been open a lot longer. Uh, basically, um, that's the only reason that these guys are on the waterfront, because Seahorse World started up first and it was the same people and this building was available. Okay, and what's the point of the platypus echidna world? Is it to breed? Is it to rescue animals? What, what is so it actually? So they are rescue animals. So basically, if they can't be re-released, it's educational based, so we don't have a breeding program at all for them. They're animals that come here that can't physically be re-released for one reason or another. So basically, um, platypus are pretty, pretty well impossible to breed in captivity anyway, especially in this environment, but we are just educational based. So it is a, a, a privately owned business. So basically, uh, we're just educating people on the platypus and the echidna. Okay, one last question. Are you open seven days a week? We What's... are. So the only day we close is Christmas Day. Right, excellent. Every other time of the year, we're open for seven days. Yes. No worries. Did you get the prices? Mm -hmm. Right, thanks very much. No worries at all. Out here on the street, I'm losing my way You've got into me, and that's my mistake Some might say, I can't get too far without seeing your name Adults 2480, concession 2250, children under 4 free, children 4 to 16, 10 dollars yeah. 50 and a family ticket is 63 dollars to adults and children there's a 45 minute guided tour through the cave, the farm and the aquarium. You can get an annual pass if you're a Tasmanian for adults 42, children 18 or family 100. Hey guys, we've got Jesse here at uh, Seahorse World Hello. in Beauty Point. Beauty Point, which is basically on the north central of Tasmania. Mm. Mate, what is this place all about? What do we expect? So, to see? um, a lot of seahorses. So we're a commercial seahorse farm. So we breed seahorses here and then export them worldwide. So mainly like pet retailers, aquariums and schools. So um, yeah, we take guided tours through the farm. It's a 45 minute tour, basically just like behind the scenes of an aquaculture facility. So we've been farming for about 23 years now in this building, all up between us now, parent company about 26 years of seahorse farming. So. Okay, and how big did the seahorse grow in cap? Are they, do they grow bigger in captivity than they do in the ocean? Um, around about the same. So the ones that we breed, the pot bellies, um, they're not that big in real life, but biggest on earth, they can get up to 35 centimetres. Right. Typically it's about 25 to 28 max. And yeah, in the wild they're typically about the same size too. And do you breed them here or do you catch them in the ocean or how's it work? Um, so we'll collect some from the wild, um, say collect maybe 20 and from that we can breed hundreds of thousands every year. Okay. So, um, and yeah. is there a big demand for seahorses? Surprisingly, yeah. Like um, we'll breed and sell, I don't know the exact numbers, but thousands and thousands of seahorses every year. So. You've seen them all over the world? Yep, all around the world. Yeah, okay. uh, to the best of my knowledge we're the only farm that can export globally. Are Australian seahorses different to say seahorses in America or somewhere else or are they all the same sort of? I mean, seahorses are seahorses, but um, so we have the most species in Australia. We've got about 24 out of the 50 to 60 known species. Okay. Um, yeah, and as I said, we've got the biggest, so yeah, up to 35. Um, fundamentally though, they're pretty much the same. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot, mate. Appreciate Pleasure. It. Anytime. Cheers. Cheers.
combines the three bones. Now, once they collect the bait, it's not that they end up over in the system here, they do for generally the next two months. After they're young, we Seahorse World. What did you think of Seahorse World, Rose? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Compared to the platypus, I didn't really rate the platypus world. Um, I didn't see the value in it because we have been to Mole Creek and there's platypus out there. But the sea, the Seahorse World, I liked it because you get there was heaps of room for people to look in all the little um, what do you call it windows. It was good. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot better than Platypus World. Yeah. If I had the choice, I'd ditch Platypus World and come to this one. Yeah, definitely. But, and uh, it was good seeing them from like little tiny babies about two centimetres long, all up, you know, up to about 18, 20 centimetres. It's good. Thanks, baby. It's that time again, joke time with Dave. Hey, Roz. Mm hmm. A dung beetle walked into a bar and said to the barman, Is this stool taken? <laughs> Catches. <laughs>